Told by the major modeling agencies that her skin was too dark, Sims did not let that stop her from chasing after her dream. Born in 1948, Sims overcame a difficult childhood to find nearly instant success as a model in New York when she arrived in 1966 on scholarship to study at the Fashion Institute of Technology. A friend of artist Andy Warhol, Sims was the first black model to appear on the cover of a mainstream magazine when she was featured by Ladies Home Journal in 1968. She personified the slogan, Black is Beautiful, with equal emphasis on deep color and high value. When that lady walked through the door, nobody else existed, said Wilhelmina Cooper. She was the elegant, beautiful, classic, dark-skinned beauty that we really needed at that time, said Bethan Hardison. Naomi Sims used the things that worked against her as a young girl, like her height, her chocolate skin, her smile, the short hair, and big laughter. They became her calling card and what made her what you would call a supermodel, said Mickey Taylor. She was so graceful, well-spoken, and she had a certain etiquette about her, said Pat Cleveland. When she put on a garment, something just marvelous happened. She was one of the chicest women in the world and would inspire future icons such as Pat Cleveland and Alva Chin to become great muses of fashion history, said Stephen Burroughs. With many firsts accomplished in her career as the first black model on the cover of New York Times, Fashion of the Times Supplement and Life magazine, Naomi was an inspiration. She had great style, beauty, grace, and an air of mystery. And after five years, she gave up modeling and started a wig making business with styles designed for black women. It eventually expanded into a multi-million dollar beauty empire and at least five books on modeling and beauty. Sims made the switch from model to mogul with ease. The Naomi Sims beauty brand was grossing five million by 1989. I use modeling as a stepping stone into the business arena. It was never my ultimate goal to be a model. I had to make a name for myself so I could put it on my products, said Naomi Sims. Deeply private, Sims remained largely out of the public eye once she retired from modeling. She was honored at Oprah Winfrey's Legends Ball in 2005. Four years later, she died of cancer in New York, New Jersey. She has left us a proud legacy that all of us black supermodels have benefited from, said Iman. You cannot talk about black models without talking about the importance of Naomi Sims, said Marcellus Reynolds. She is an icon as you can see, and she is your icon's favorite icon in the modeling world, okay? She broke a lot of barriers, but she went through a lot. Her life is not a tragedy. It is a beautiful life of triumph, and she left an amazing legacy for everyone to follow that came after her. We're going to get into her life, her childhood, but we're going to talk also about her iconic career. We're going to wrap it up with a bow with her most iconic beauty secrets. But first, hey friend, welcome to my channel, Kareen Allude, where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars through history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so. And if you're already subscribed, please turn on your notification bell so you never miss an upload. Now, without further ado, let's get into this video. So Naomi Sims was the youngest of three girls born to John and Elizabeth Sims in Oxford, Mississippi on March 30th, 1948. Soon after her birth, her parents split up and following the divorce, her mother moved them to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Not long after they settled in, her mother fell ill and the children were put into foster care. And according to Black Past, she was later raised by a black couple who lived in a working class neighborhood of Homewood in Pittsburgh. Although she tried to adjust to her new housing accommodations, Naomi reflected in later years that she didn't feel welcomed or loved, especially compared to a younger foster daughter who had a fairer complexion. Greatly compounding the hurt felt from being separated from her family was that her mother, Elizabeth, who lived less than a mile away from her foster home, continued to raise her two other sisters, Doris and Betty. So can you imagine your mom lives less than a mile away from you while you're in foster care being raised by foster parents and your mother's raising your two other sisters but didn't keep you? That's crazy. But despite this traumatic experience, Naomi was extremely close to her sisters. She told Essence, and I quote, I didn't feel inferior as a child, but I was made aware of color. My mother felt that the Negro was inferior and she lived in a poor white neighborhood. In kindergarten, I can remember being the only Negro in an all white school. At the age of nine, I was taken away from my mother to live in a home for girls in a series of foster homes. It took me a long time to get over it. I used to cry at night and say, I want mommy. 
The social worker promised me that I would be returned to my mother, who she said was very sick. But when I was 10, I realized I would never be placed with my natural mother again. I had always wanted a wonderful mother and father. It was my ideal. Success is important to me because of my childhood. It gives me security. It's an obsession to become somebody and to be somebody really important, end quote. So she always wanted to be seen as important because she didn't feel important as a child. So it was very important to her that she grew up as an adult to have a lot of importance so that she wouldn't be rejected anymore. Naomi was notably tall for her age, standing at five foot 10 by the time she was a freshman in high school. This led to her being bullied at her high school, but after graduating from high school, she was awarded a scholarship to the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. There she pursued studies in textiles and management. And while also taking night classes in psychology at New York University starting in 1966, after high school graduation, Naomi discovered her height was her greatest asset. When money for classes at New York famed Fashion Institute ran out, a counselor suggested modeling. Despite her qualifications, Naomi found it difficult to get modeling jobs due to racial bias. Some agencies even told her that her skin was too dark to model. However, she didn't let this stop her. She decided to bypass the agencies and approach fashion photographers directly. One such photographer, Gosta Peterson agreed to feature her on the cover of the fashion supplement in August 1967. And despite this achievement, she still struggled to find work until she met Wilhelmina Cooper, which I did a video for and I will pin in the comments for you guys to watch because she really was a sweetheart and all the models loved her. I already said that she probably had one of the best agencies and she was one of the first to make a way for black women also. She was a former Dutch model herself who was setting up her own agency, Wilhelmina Models. Cooper agreed to represent Naomi, and in 1968, when Naomi was just 20 years old, she was chosen for a national TV campaign for AT&T, where she modeled clothes designed by Bill. Featured alongside a Caucasian and Asian model, the AT&T campaign provided Naomi Sims with national coverage. That coverage promoted viewers to want to learn more about her. Viewers included those in the fashion world and they now wanted to hire her. Sims became one of the first successful black models while still in her teens and achieved worldwide recognition from the late 1960s into the early 1970s. Appearing in popular fashion magazines such as Vogue, Vogue Italia, and Cosmopolitan. By 1970, she had become one of the first successful black models, gaining international fame. She was even featured on the cover of Life magazine's October 17, 1969 issue, making her the first black model to do so. Although she could be seen at famed and exclusive spots such as Studio 54 and The Factory, which was owned by her friend, artist and recluse Andy Warhol, she was known to be the quintessential professional. She honored her commitments and gave insight in order to get the best photos. She arrived on time for shoots, having done her own makeup and hair prior because many makeup artists had no skills in making up someone in her complexion. For all the glamour, Naomi became increasingly restless over the narcissism of her trade. The toughest thing about modeling, she says, is being involved with yourself 24 hours a day. She was reluctant to talk about what she did for a living. People think all models are stupid, she notes angrily. Naomi wasn't. The toughest part of being a model is having to think of yourself eight hours a day. It's not natural to paint your face every morning, to stand in front of cameras all day and have to impress people. If you have a headache or something disturbs you, you can't ever let it show on your face. A model always is on. The word model is perfect for where you're often reduced to a clothespin. Modeling can be boring. You just stand there while everyone fights about what they want you to do. You have to be careful not to get too wrapped in it. Usually people in fashion aren't the most pleasant, but you have to put up with it because they're paying. I sometimes have to go to business cocktail parties where drunken men make sensual remarks and I have to act naive. At work the next day, they are terribly professional and have completely forgotten that the night before they patted you on your booty. Still, if I felt the fashion scene was repulsive, I wouldn't have stayed in it. And do I think I could exist if there wasn't a fashion world? No. Often women are jealous of models. They think she can wear absolutely anything she wants. She has no problem with her diet, her skin. She makes tons of money and she is beautiful. They think we must be very secure. I think the most beautiful women are often the most insecure. They look at themselves in the mirror and don't really feel they are beautiful. They worry about aging. They wonder, are they going to be eternally beautiful? Do everybody think they are beautiful? End quote.
In 1972, Hollywood offered the 24-year-old at the time a leading role in the movie Cleopatra Jones. However, Naomi declined the offer due to the film's portrayal of black people. The role was then given to Tamara Dobson, which I did a video for also. Naomi retired from modeling in 1973 at the age of 25 to start her own business. She launched a successful wig line, which grew into a multi-million dollar beauty empire. She also wrote five books on modeling and beauty. In August 1973, Naomi married Michael Michael Finlay, a New York art dealer, their interracial marriage sparked some controversy. They had a son named Bob Finlay, but ended up divorcing in 1991. Shortly after, Naomi made headlines as one of the first major celebrities to openly admit that she was living with bipolar disorder. In a 2009 article, Naomi Sims cover girl of the New York Times journalist Michael Sokolov reported an account of Sims' son, Bob, writing, he remembers his mother once waking him up in the middle of the night when he was a child and the two of them walking for hours on the city streets. He thinks he was not quite five. We walked all around Manhattan and she just talked and talked. It felt like an amazing adventure with my mother, but looking back on it, I think it was more than that. Three months ago, as she knew she was dying, she told me I'm ready to share it, end quote. Naomi Sims passed away from breast cancer on August 1st, 2009, at the age of 61 in Newark, New Jersey. She left behind her son, Bob Finlay, a granddaughter, and her older sister, Betty Sims. Finally, let's get into some of our beauty secrets to end this up really nicely. Miss Sims attained success at the same time that the Black is Beautiful movement was taking hold, and her accomplishments as a barrier-breaking African-American model helped pave the way for the Black runway stars of the 1970s. So she took her beauty very seriously. She told Essence, and I quote, Beauty is internal. A good healthy diet is vital. Fresh fruits, vegetables, not cook too long, and cook with the lids on the pots so they retain their vitamins. Chicken and fish, if you like, and plenty of water. We also need to reduce the pressure on ourselves. Black women are the most exacting women in the world. We're hard on ourselves. Find quiet time, whether it's for prayer, meditation, cooling out, or just thinking cool inner thoughts. Using harsh products, believing the myth that most blacks have oily skin, and using the wrong products as a result. Using harsh astringents, also very often we use our hands too harshly on our face. Be gentle. And of course, stress. It's the number one killer of the skin. One, find a skincare regimen and stick to it. Two, invest in a toner that has been formulated especially for the most sensitive black skin. And finally, commit yourself to eating one good food a day. One that you don't necessarily like, but know is good for your skin. Then try to include that piece of fruit or vegetable in your diet. Your skin deserves it. When you choose a foundation, let it match your facial skin color as closely as possible. Never use a foundation that is lighter than your skin. In fact, in order to make a close match, you must choose a tint very slightly darker than your own. This will even the skin tone. I'm confident of my appearance, yet it does involve disciplinary problems. I must get eight to 10 hours of sleep, which means I can't go out every night and party. And even if I don't get dark circles under my eyes, I'm not in good shape mentally. When I started out, I was so insecure, I couldn't leave the house without looking in the mirror 15 times. If I came into a studio with too much makeup and the photographer said, you have to take some of it off, I'd get very uptight. I would just smile and not say anything. Because I wanted everybody to like me, I was always smiling and always so charming. But I found there were so many people who really bugged me that I'd go home at night with a headache. I felt rotten and it showed in my pictures. I know now I can't possibly please everyone." End quote. This was some very solid advice and she is just so iconic till today. When you talk about models, you cannot talk about models and not bring up Naomi Sims. Just a beautiful, beautiful woman, right? Please leave a brown heart in the comments for her. And also don't be shy to comment below who else would you guys like me to do a video for. If you like the music you're listening to, the link is in the description. Thumbs up this video. I love you guys so much. Thank you for tuning in. Until next time.